Hi folks. Do make yourself known if you're online. I know it's been all oh, nearly two weeks. Oh dearie me. So, apologies first off for the issues I had last week. Things just weren't working at all. It's driving me mad. And now my hair is driving me mad. It's so unbelievably long now. It's getting in my eyes. Um, but I do now have an appointment. They have opened uh, hairdressers and barbers and stuff in the UK. We are slowly but surely coming out of lockdown. Um, so I've booked one. So hopefully next time on the next stream that you see me, I will have um, had my uh, hair somewhat reduced. But I hope everyone's good and healthy. Um, hi, Laurie. How are you doing? Um, just getting myself sorted here. Bear with me. A couple of news items I probably want to just go through, then we're going to talk about amalgam. Um, right. First, 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 let's have a look. Oh yes, very important news. Uh, um, Black Ice is now back in stock and available in Tindy. Yay! As are the uh, breadboard adapters. Light on this situation. It's still very light outside here. Days are uh, getting longer and longer. I'm thinking about changing around. Um, my work area is basically in front of me here. You can't see it. Is my test and compute area. Um, also, where I've got some printers and that kind of stuff. And then over here, on my right hand side. Uh, is my uh, bench area really? I've got my spare water, and that's where all the soldering and stuff goes on. There was a test workstation over there. It's actually disconnected now. The screen and stuff is still up, um, and then I've got a few extractors and stuff here, and then I've got my microscope here as well. But um, in the summer, what happens is the light comes in from behind me through the the uh, window and the glass doors which goes straight onto the screen it makes it quite difficult so what I really want to do is turn things around so that my computer so where 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 the screen is there um, and possibly a two screen set up there and oh there um i'd like to move things around but it would take me an entire weekend to shift everything around um so i've just been putting it off um but i have been thinking about it i also need to clear this center island up which is full of junk and also my uh half made 3d printer i've been putting together um that'd be nice but the other thing is you won't have the washing machine in the background as well in the boiler, which aren't particularly good backdrops. They probably have something worse, so we will see. But anyhow, it's good to be back streaming after all the issues I had in the last week or so. And as I say, the um, black ice is back in stock. See the link. <coughs> so that's kind of cool. Let's have a look at any other news items. So that's the obvious important one. Um, 
let's have a quick look on Twitter because there's something interesting here. I like this. This is good. Um, this is a post um, by Gatecat, formerly FPGA Dave. Um, I didn't realize this, but uh, Day, 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 day. Uh, they was working on the um, Project Oxide, which is the um, version of uh, Place and Root for um, the new lattice. Uh, what do they call it? the Serbius range of which you've got the crosslink NX and the Serbius I think CX and um, so he's been I know he's, they've done a lot of work on uh, the uh, software size and there was some recent updates which is pretty good but what I didn't know that Gatecat was also working on was this uh, really interesting looking board um, let me see if I can get my browser up so you can see it as well um, hold on hold on hold on hold on hold on I'll check the comment in a sec as well let me just get my browser up first uh, So there's a post talking about it. So he, um, they have produced this, or um, they're working on this board, which is um, apparently um, augmented reality and virtual reality board. I didn't realize that that was uh, one of the plans. Um, let's give you a link directly to that project as well. Um, it's very cool. Now the parts for all of this new uh, family have been impossible to get hold of. We managed to get some stuff a while back, like a dev board, um, which is good. But um, the actual chip's been very difficult to get hold of, but apparently Gatecat saying that uh, the order's coming in. So um, work can recommence on that. Um, I don't think I'll be doing a, any board in, in short order at the moment because I, I don't think there's any reliability in the supply of the parts. I may, if I can get hold of some of the parts, I may do a proto early proto board just so I can start playing around with things but since um, that is have released these chips they just haven't been available um, which is really annoying um, but I love this picture wow what a shot look at that complicated not one bit of it I think it's got to be six layers maybe eight probably six let me just check up the comment, catch up with the comments here. Um, Laurie's been tidying up, relabeling his electronics and work areas. Good idea. Yeah, I've been doing some of that. I have tidied up a bit, to be fair. Um, and I'm trying to do a bit at a time. Um, it's a good uh, spring clean, as they say. Um, oh, Laurie's talking about my 3D printer is now old and probably beyond repair. Well, that's why I've got a new one. Because uh, my old one, I wouldn't say it's expired, but the bits from it are in a little box down here that I retrieve from uh, our hack space um, recently. Um, because I want to reuse uh, the steppers and stuff for it. So I ordered a new 3D printer anyhow. 
uh, when I saw it on offer but it is a build yourself one and I got halfway through it with my youngest uh, and then she went back to university so uh, we kind of stopped so I need to revisit that it's on my list of to do's fortunately my list of to do's is quite long although I have gotten through a few recently to be fair um, yeah I mean if yours has expired Laurie uh, you can always um, retrieve its parts because they do have useful parts things like the uh, stepper motors for example you'll probably find you have at least four stepper motors which should be useful um, one of the things that I do want to do is uh, um, to work on some FP FPGA control movement and stuff in fact I've just ordered from um, from Asia some uh, maker beam type stuff so I can build some rails to do some stuff so that'd be cool but that's a long-term project and that's I've still got quite a lot to do on that um, I will revisit that and I need to order some of the stuff I've got to make an order soon anyhow so from that supplier I know they've got some of the motor drivers I want I will probably order some of the base drivers as well um, because I need to get some bits. I mean, I'll, I'll mention this in a little bit when we move on to amalgam. Um, but yeah, we've had some issues. Um, so anyhow, that project looks really cool. Can't wait to see what Gatecat's going to do with that. That's really interesting. Uh, it also means he's going to probably put together some interesting um, gateware on the camera side should be useful um, I've been going back through the ESP5 stuff given the fact that I'm now working most of the time on the uh, amalgam stuff checking various different things um, so that was an interesting piece of news was there any others uh, the other interesting thing about Project Oxide which is the Servius port for the place and route is the heat that uh, Gatecat has actually done it in Rust as well, which is really cool. I'm really looking forward to that because I'll be able to hack around with that. I'm hoping um, that that will hopefully slot into some things later um, when I do the CSP stuff. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, what other news do we have that I want to cover before we go on to the other amalgam stuff? Hmm. Anything on my Twitter that I saved? Right, um, so I did Black Ice MX. Uh, oh, this is really cool. Um, so Great Scott Gadgets um, have, along with Kate Temkin as well, she she's doing the... Um, Gateware for it, I believe. Um, this is really cool. I love this. So, oh, let me give you a link. Sorry, before I do that. So, this is basically a USB analyzer um, made with a lattice ECP5. Um, so, it's not live yet as a campaign, but you can subscribe to it. I definitely want to get me one of these. Assuming you don't price it stupidly. Um, also, they're using um, some of the stuff I'm using on Amalgam as well. So, given that Kate's doing all that gateway, that's going to be useful because we'll be able to lean on some of that on the um, 
on the amalgam side, which is very cool. But you, this board is brilliant, really interesting. So you've got to basically, uh, it's, first of all, it's not USB free. I should make that very clear. Um, this is USB 2, but high speed, so 418 megabits per second. Um, so you can do a USB in, USB high speed in, USB high speed out. Plus you've got a sideband USB here for doing the analysis, and I think that can connect to the microcontroller on the board as well. But it means you can hack into what's going on on the USB, and Kate's writing some really good software for it as well. Um, there are open source USB analyzers and things out there, but the software does tend to be a bit crap, basically. Um, this looks like it's going to be a lot more impressive. And the fact that it's ECP5 based and based on the open tools, based on um, uh, Next PNR, obviously, but also Edmigen, um, that's really rather cool. So I'm uh, I'm rather happy about this, um, but yeah, that's on Crowd. Um, what do I call Crowd Supply? Is it? I feel always get yeah, Crowd Supply, but it's not live yet. But you can subscribe to updates so that you know when it goes live. So do support that if you are doing any USB work. Um, but as I say, it's only up to USB two high speed, not USB three. USB three is an entirely different animal. And much more difficult, I should add. So that's a really cool thing. Um, you can see here. Uh, that's that's the announcement on uh, um, on Crowd Supply. You can see the core uh, features here. Lunar um, protocol analysis for low, full, and high speed USB. Uh, create your own flow. So it's, it's good for actually creating USB devices as well, which will be useful for us. And um, Meddler in the middle attacks. Uh, yeah, Kate's done all sorts of hacking on USB as well before now. Apparently, she's famous for. As a hacker in the Daily Mail, <laughs> but um, USB reverse engineering and security research, which is kind of good. Technical specifications, so it's based on a 12F. Um, as I say, it's got uh, 418 megabits per second high-speed USB 2 interface, and um, Oh, it's also got a Type A connector as well. So if you're going down to a, you know, Type A device, so two Type C connectors in and out, and one Type A as well. Plus, it's got a sideband to see. On board, there's also a Sam D11, which is a bug controller. Um, so they use that as a JTAG controller, interestingly. Um, for the FPG uh, for the ESP5, uh, built-in USB to serial communications bridge. That's your side channel there. Uh, a variety of simple built-in debug mechanisms, including utilities, allow enabling you to create simple PC accessible register interfaces. So it looks really good. Oh, and you can control the USB power switching as well, which is nice between incoming and target or host and target. Uh, 64 megabit of RAM for buffering. Well, what RAM are they using? Hold on, 64 megabit. Is that uh, maybe it's one of these QSPI ones? Possibly. <laughs> um, two unpopulated user IO SMA connector footprints. Intended for trigger in, trigger out use, clock data synchronization. Oh, and two unpopulated PMOD connectors. So you can actually do you do some PMOD based hacking on there as well, which is nice. It's got a four megabit spy connected flash. 
6 FPGA connected user LEDs. Yeah, lots of LEDs. So I mean, there's a flash and there's uh, SRAM on there. Maybe that's the SRAM. Maybe that's uh, wind bonds. I wonder if that's. Maybe that's hyper RAM rather than spy RAM, possibly. Don't know what it says. Is it 64 megabit, 8 megabyte RAM for you buffering USB? Yeah, it's not specific about it. I'm guessing it's probably um, probably hyper hyper RAM would be my guess. But wind bomb rather than the Cypress one, which is probably better value for money, frankly. <coughs> um, and full featured open source USB protocol. And uh, this actually looks quite cool USB software, um, much better than what's out there, which is a bit crap. The open source stuff that's out there for the current open source hardware and language. It includes all the necessary hardware for low, full, and high-speed protocol analysis, which means you can provide the same functionality as an expensive commercial USB analyzers, like the uh, Beagle. Yeah, yeah, it's really expensive. All the cool ones. Um, yeah, nice. We like it. This looks good. Excellent. Um, Laurie's saying the gateway was just USB device, not host. When I last looked, um, I am more interested in. I USB host. Oh, what's I USB? Don't know what that is. Charles Papon has started doing a spinal HDL USB host. Well, there must be host support. There's probably some host support. I mean, you might want to go and have a look at the um, gateway, see what's there. Um, samples USB sock USB uh, ACM serial counter device interrupt device isynchronous count loop back uh, simple device stream out device yeah, I don't see anything particularly host based at this point. Um, SOC. What does the SOC do? Minerva. <coughs> yeah, you need to uh, dig in a bit deeper and see. I don't see any obvious host stuff there. There's no reason why the host stuff couldn't be done. Um, but it does require a lot more user code, soft code, software. Um, you'll probably be able to do more with it, that on our side of things. Mind you, it depends whether you want to run it on the Spinal HGL SOC or not, I guess. I don't quite understand what I call that SOC. Anyhow, you get the picture. Interesting, no? It's 
So um, that was that. This is a really odd name thing here. The USB Talks Face Dancer. Where I come from that means something different. But there you go. Um, based on original good fit based face testers. This was um, from Great Scott Gadgets. Their uh, software wasn't it? USB proxy. Overall protocol analysis. I think this is really just um, a breaking into the USB stuff as opposed to running it as any kind of host. Um, what does I say? Doesn't need host to sit between host and the device. True. It just passes the data through, doesn't it? When I looked a month or, ago, a month or so ago, it said it didn't support host, but could be extended to it. Right, what else do we have? Well, the list. Uh, um, so, Hmm, I think that's most of my items that I wanted to cover. So the Payunora has um, been launched as well, but I think um, we covered that last time. So I think we've done all of that stuff. That we needed to cover, which is good. So let's move on to the amalgam stuff. Oh, crikey, I've just realized this is all wrong. The name of this thread. Bear with me, let me just change my stream information. I don't know if this gets reflected straight away, probably not. Update information. Right, that stuff. So, um, do, 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 do. I have tea as well, by the way, folks, which is good because I need tea this evening. Um, so, I want to talk about amalgam. Uh, I'll remind you what that is in a minute in case you've forgotten but um, it's basically the ECB5 board that I'm working on the Maestro. Been working on this an awful long time although it wasn't called amalgam initially. I think it started life as black injection but that's a long long time ago. I mean the project started a long long time ago and I've been through a number of different iterations with it quite frankly um, and more recently I got very frustrated with it from a couple of different points of view um, there were some supply issues that I've hit um, which are just annoying I mean everyone's getting supply issues I think I've solved most of them um, I've still got some issues with some jelly bean parts to be honest but um, I think I've solved most of the other issues, which is good. Uh, I'll point to that in a sec. But um, I just wasn't happy with the design. So, and I was going from one side to the other. And in the end, I thought, right, well, what I've got to do here is make what I think is the best board. What I'd want around the ECP5. But also taking into account, you know, what others have said people like. Um, Laurie, for instance, it's 
giving me lots of feedback, which is cool. Hopefully we can go through and just check all those boxes. But one of the things that means is there has been one, certainly one big change since um, we last spoke about it or showed anything on it. Um, maybe two, um, depending on what you compare it to. We kind of went up in terms of dimensions as well, and then I've come back down again. I'm also trying to do a bit of an optimization at the moment um, in terms of the components on it for obvious reasons. But just to show you what I mean, um, we've got an awful lot of goodies here. I don't know if you can see that box here, but we've got an awful lot of stuff. Um, it's probably easier if I show a side view of this. You'll get an idea of how much stuff I've already acquired here. Um, so I mean, a lot of stuff. A lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of components. So I'm mostly there in terms of what's required. Damn it, hold on a sec. I'm just straighten the bottle for the floor. Trays. The waffle trays are like these um, high density, you know, you can see all the stuff. Look, loads of it. Um, so, I mean, it's the bulk of the stuff. What that doesn't include is all the passive stuff. Um, but, um, yeah. So we're kind of getting there, but like everything, you know, these <laughs> components are tiny, but the packaging they come in is ginormous. So, if, for example, if you look at the um, microcontrollers, I'll show you how they come packed. So, for example, this, yeah, probably see from the label. These are STM 32 H7s, I think. Oh, these ones are F7s. So that is a tray of 168, which is a standard size for the TQF100, um, which is the microcontroller size I'm using. So I've got a whole crap load of these. I've got many more than I need. Let's put it that way. Um, I'm thinking of maybe staggering the um, production because of issues um, with certain things in terms of supply. What I'm thinking is maybe um, to prioritize the um, high end version first because that's it's important. Um, I know a lot of people will want that, or there's a bunch of people that have been patiently waiting that really want to get their hands on that stuff. So that will be based around um. Hold on. Um, 
So it will be based around a, um, let me get the CAD up actually. It's a good, good entry point. So if we switch to, let me turn the browser off. Let me just put the, uh, here's the PCB. What? PCB layout, where have you gone? Just promote that. Hold on. You get this on screen. Damn, it's just too short. Okay. All done, roughly. Oh! My window has moved slightly. Don't like that. Okay, whatever. So, uh, as you can see here on the layout, let me just point out various things on this. So I'll enumerate it as if it's a um, as if it's the high end version first. Um, a couple of reasons for that. The first is that um, the uh, I think I have most of the components certainly for the um, iron board but not all of them um, sorry and the low end board I'm definitely missing a few because there's higher quantities involved as well but let me also Um, just double check the size here. I want to get the memory size right, but what I believe. Is yeah, if I do this first. Right, so uh let's let's start at the bottom here so on the bottom of this you can't see it it's the it's an 80 pin connector that has all the significant io on on the base of the board and we've moved that down from 100 pin very important because we don't need as many as the ancillary pins um we're doing as much on the board as we can in other words um There is a, uh, a switch mode supply here. That's a one volt eight for the uh, DDR RAM, among other things. And there's also like a JTAG header. So the amount of memory we've got here is 64 megabytes or 512 megabits, and it's DDR2. So it's pretty rapid, fast enough for our FPGA. Um, and there is um, some hardware support built into the ECP5 to support both DDR2 and DDR3, etc. 
Uh, I don't think Litex supports it, but um, we will probably have to write that. I, probably, I might write it in my gen, or I might do it in Verilog. I'm not sure yet, or someone else may do it. But um, that will definitely need a drive of lighting, because I'm not aware of one that exists currently for this. Um, the ETB5 here is a 256-ball version. Uh, and on the high-end version, this is the 45F, which is the biggest capacity, I think, in the 256-ball version, which is the size that I wanted here. So there's 45,000 LUTs, effectively, plus a nice uh, big selection of memory. Um, and then over here is the microcontroller, which is hooked up via the FMC, which is the uh, external memory bus controller built into the STM32, to the uh, ECB5. That pathway between the two is 16-bit. And I think it will run on this version, which is uh, the STM32750, is a 400 megahertz STM uh, H7 chip. Uh, and the bus runs, the 16 um, 16-bit memory bus runs at, I think it's 133 uh, megahertz. So you effectively got 266 um, megabytes per sec between the two, which is nice. Very rapid. Um, that will also probably have a 32 megabit uh, QSPI flash, which you can see underneath here, actually, amongst the capacitors. Um, and then if we moved move to the top of this now um, if we start from this end here right hand side so we've got a USB-C connector here and then the STM32 uh, H7 uh, supports uh, high speed 480 megabit per second USB via a ULPI interface, which is what this chip is here. So we've got nice, you know, half a gigabit's worth of transfer speed, you know, high speed USB 2 coming in and out here. Uh, we've got some jelly bean like supply components and things. There's an RGB status LED here. Then this USB here is also attached to the SDM32, which is the debug uh, channel for the USB. Um, and I'll come back round to that. Um, the two uh, FPC vertical connectors here, or right angle connectors, vertical, pointing upwards, are for things like um, cameras. You know, like Raspberry Pi type cameras or uh, infrared type versions of those. Um, so potentially, I'm hoping we'll be able to run two at once. Possibly, we're going to have to check out how well that works. But um, I was hoping we could kind of overlay infrared and normal or do stereo maybe. Um, and then. Also on the video side connected to the ECB5. Excuse me. We have the HDMI, mini HDMI cable with, with, um, connector, which is going to be done the right way around this time. We're not going to have the same problem as we have with the Black Ice MX. Um, in between those two, we've got uh, four RGB LEDs. So, where we normally have four different coloured uh, LEDs, um, on this version of the board, we actually have uh, four RGB LEDs, which are driven by the ECB5. So it's going to be a fun little display, um, capable of showing all sorts of different patterns. We've got a power LED here, um, some more jelly bean components, supplies like VCC for the ECB5, etc. And then um, over here we've got another USB-C connector, so it's the third USB-C 
next one here and that again is a high speed uh half a gigabit you know 480 megabytes per second high speed usb 2 driven by the same uh ulpi phy here but this one isn't connected to the stm32 this one's connected to the b 5 which is why i pointed out that the lunar stuff will be interesting so you could run that however you want as you know either uh, a, a device or uh, as a host if you could uh, get the host stuff working which is kind of cool then underneath here we've got an sd card i'm still trying to work out the best placement of that that's proving troublesome um that is connected to both the it's connected via SPI to both the STM32 and the ECP5. I know that's something that uh, Laurie um, liked to have, so that both the FPGA and the um, STM32 can access it. Also, the STM32 can program the ECP5 um, through the uh, uh, SPI interface built in. That enables us to do a normal reprogram, but it also enables us to write to memory locations and things as well uh, when we place it into programming mode, which is kind of cool. Um, and that really summarizes what's on the board. So I've kind of removed anything extraneous. Anything else you want to do will really be done through this, you know. Uh, set of ports here which connect to the expansion board and the way this mounts is that plugs in so the, the this is the same sort of dimensions as the black edge connector only as 80 pins rather than 50 pins so on the black edge you had two either side 50 pins on here you've just got one 80 pin which is two rows of 40 and then you've also got some supporting mounting holes here as well because you need to mount that at the front so it's mechanically stable so it's a nice simple layout i'm still optimizing it slightly still working on the routing um and we do some work on that schematic today i've also found some issues with the um library parts particularly the usb one which someone's clearly done a copy and paste on and gotten the wrong there are lots of different versions of these ulpi chips uh, and they are subtly different and somebody seems to have done a copy and paste across a bunch of these um, on the on the parts that I've got. So I'm going to have to. One of the things we need to do, probably do that today, actually, is go and edit that. So that is really it. But in terms of what comes out on the IOs below to interface with the board below, we've got 64 digital signals from the ECP five or it can be 32 differentials if you like they, they can all be differential so we've got really good selection of those there's a relatively short path between the ESP5 and the connector as well um, in addition we have um, eight ABC inputs which go directly into the STM32 which can go up to I believe uh, if you're interleaving them up to 7.2 mega samples per second or 2.5 normally if you're not interleaving them because uh, it's actually got three ADCs on board um, and you can spread that over the pins there's a couple of buttons um, uh, the STM32 has both low speed RTC 32 kilohertz oscillator and a high speed, probably 25 megahertz oscillator. Um, anything else that I've missed on here? At this point, I'm still trying to remove components, funny enough. There's still a few too many components on there for my liking, and I'm trying to shave a few off. Um, there's also some components on the underneath, which I've pointed to. Um, but most of those are just passives, caps, and resistors. And there's still quite a few resistors and caps missing from this, or mainly caps, actually, for coupling stuff and supply caps. But um, those will go on pretty shortly. So I'm going to have a sip of tea. What do you think, Laurie? 
the changes are you happy with the way that's panned out have you got any questions i know you were you've been following along on this particular stuff quite closely does it tick all your checkboxes as it ticks mine Do let me know, and anyone else that's online as well, not just Laurie. I know Laurie's got an opinion on this. Um, the um, dots, if you want the schlaw, it's in the big fridge. I think I swapped the two around. Because once you open it, it leaks otherwise. If you lie on its side, the tops aren't very good on them. So try and put those in the big fridge. He's going cold. Is there SPI flash on the board? Yes, there is, Laurie. Um, under the STM32 here is a 32 megabit flash for the high end version. You can actually see it under here, actually. Point. A bit difficult to see. Yeah, um, so the uh, high end will have 32 megabit, and I think the low end one, the 12F one, will only have. Yeah, it's good. good idea to point out the differences. So I, I I can probably do all the all the parts for the high end board. I won't have all the parts for the low end board yet. I'm also going to probably make about twice as many of the low end board as I do as the high end board. Um, I'm guessing at popularity and pricing, but that will probably be how it tends to go out. Um, but I'm probably going to make the high end board first. I probably won't make the low end board. Probably for several months afterwards, be my guess. I, I have, don't have exact time scales yet because I'm still waiting on a few components, but um, you get the picture. But um, the low end board will look roughly, and this is still subject to change as I'm having issues getting supply. So the difference will be the ESP5 will be a 12F, not a 45F. The memory won't be a 64 megabyte. 512 megabit it will be a 32 megabyte and uh, which is a 256 megabit version but the same capabilities i.e. Um, uh, DDR2 and the uh, microcontroller on there won't be the 400 megahertz H7, it will be a 216 megahertz F7. So those will be the main differences, and it'll be a 16 megabit flash, not a 32 megabit flash. So the specs will be lower, um, and that will bring the cost down as well. Um, assuming I can get all the bits, which isn't guaranteed at this point. On, uh, Laurie saying on the ULX 3S, the 85F was much more popular than the 12F, and practically nobody bought the 45F. Yeah, well, it depends, it doesn't just depend what features you have on there, it also depends on the pricing as well. And I don't, can't, I'm not sure how they priced it. Sorry. I'm not sure. And I haven't done the exact pricing yet. As I say, because I'm still waiting on a few parts. But I'm hoping that uh, we'll have. Um, we will see. But there, there probably will be a significant price difference between the two. Let's put it that way. So it depends what you want to use it for, you see. I mean, if you're going to do the higher-end video-y stuff, then clearly 
you're probably going to opt to go for the high-end A45F version. Whereas if you're perhaps doing something, you know, less arduous, then you're prob possibly going to consider the 12F version. You know, you might not need that much memory. You might not need the 400 megahertz STM32. You, you know, a 260 megahertz, you know, F7 may be good enough for you. Um, and you might not need such a large flash. Also, the, the other difference between the STM32 H7 and F7 is the H7 has about a megabyte um, of SRAM in banks, whereas the F7 probably only has about 380 something. It also has half the internal flash that the 400 meg version has as well. Yeah, I mean, it's always a dilemma. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd love it if everyone wants 45s rather than um, than 12s. That would be fantastic, Laurie. That would be brilliant. Because um, I think I can get some more 45s. Um, I've got, I've actually got more stuff stock of all the surrounding components for the 45 but not not as many of the ECP5s but I can get the ECP5s I think I mean, God. everything's really dubious at the moment in terms of ordering these components you know uh, I've had things sitting in my basket just a day or something whilst I decide what I'm ordering and just checking that I'm getting it to the right place place and that the price is reasonable and you are paying more at the moment believe you me uh, compared to what we were paying last year or the year before but um, and then you go back to your basket and find it's gone someone snapped it up because just because it's in your basket doesn't mean you know until you complete that transaction online it's uh, you know the stock is available to others so yeah it would be great if everyone wants 45s i will build 45s i've got all the other stuff i just need to get some more 45s but initially what i will do is probably a small run of the 45s to start with um then i know i've got all the other bits for especially the memory um that's the plan anyhow um, so I'll probably build I don't know about 100 115 maybe on the first run 100 is a good number for the first run um, and I might have to do because they're going to be popular I might have to do a kind of I mean, should I do it on a crowdsource? I'm not sure. Crowdsource is a lot of aggro. What do you think, Nori? Using something like crowd supply. I don't know if that's the way to go or not. At this stage. Hmm, one to think about. Anyhow, let's just switch on to the schematic. Yeah. <laughs> Laurie says, doesn't bother me how you sell it. Yeah, just give it to me. Take my money. Yes. Um, right. Um let's I was gonna do some work on the schematic. Um that's quite important. I need to finish that off. Um, so let me just switch the display over so that we've got the schematic. Hold on, where's it gone? Oh, 
There we go. Um, can you actually see that, folks? I know it's quite. Um, quite detailed. There's a lot on this schematic. I'm trying to cram it into a relatively small space as well, which probably doesn't help. If I can zoom in a bit more. Let me just manipulate some of this stuff. Zoom in a bit more. It's a little bit better. Is that any better? I've just zoomed into it one level. Um, I mean, we can zoom into particular areas. rearrange some of this stuff just slightly um, one of the things I do need to do actually is fix this damn um, USB interface this part is shifted. Maybe I can. Let's see how much time we've got. Let me show you the. Let's do the. Um, how we're going to do the LEDs because it's quite interesting. Let's just take the LEDs. Ah, hold on. I want to grab those. Um, just shift these around a bit. That's going to change just slightly. So what I'm thinking here, so on the LEDs, what I'm doing, the way I'm driving this is, uh, resistance. <clears throat> so the way that these are going to work. like this. So we're going to mux them. And I need to double check my math on some of this actually. <coughs> so they have common red, green and blue because they're RGB LEDs, right? <coughs> so the they've got common the the RGB LEDs here have common anodes at the top. So what I need to do is drive those common anodes from a pin and I'm going to call this, so this is equivalent to which LED, so when that's powered,
So that will be kind of RGB uh, so CL zero color LED zero I guess we start with and then CL one uh, CL two and CL three. So I'm going to need to drive the anodes or the positives, if you like. Zoom in a bit more. Hopefully this will be a bit clearer still. So the common uh, anodes will be driven by 3 volt free signal. So CL0, color LED 0 to through to color LED 3, um, will be, the anodes will be driven by 3 volt free pins on the ECP5. Okay. Then the common anodes, sorry, the common uh, cathodes, and that will work in this way here. So that will be called uh, blue green and red cathodes so we have blue green and red cathodes so I can control the color of each of these LEDs by enabling, say I want to control this LED. So I take this CL0 pin high and then I PWM my mixture of colors. So only this LED will be energized. So what I will do, I will, I, I will literally scan through CL0, CL1, CL2, CL3, enabling them all in turn those four lines and then set the PWM values for those um, on these colors okay that's how that will work and by the way these um, the pins I've got left over to drive these uh, these colors are actually one volt eight pins so that's going to be a bit funky, but I think we'll be okay because those are basically we need them to sync. So when they're high, the LED is effectively turned off because um, you know a uh, red or green LED will have at least 1.8 volts across it. It's energized. Blue requires you know more like two to three volts, depending on how much current. I mean it's proportional to current, but it's an exponential relationship between the two. So I'm hoping that when these are at positive uh, 1 volt 8, um, the drop across the uh, the diodes, yeah, maybe a small drop across the resistor, although there's not much current going through here, be enough to effectively have them turned off. So we're driving from 3 volt out here, and we're syncing from a 1 volt 8 signal. Um, the reason I'm using the 1 volt 8 signals is those pins I have left because there's a kind of 1 volt 8 logic side. Um, if I return you back to the um, uh, the ports on here, if we look at um, Uh, 
haven't gone through and done all this naming yet. So we've got several ports here. So this will be the port we're using. To drive the um, LED colors and also that port will be used I mean basically the the memory is a 1 volt 8 uh, DDR2 so that takes up all of this port here and in addition it uses address pins on here uh, and a couple of CAS and RAS signals on here. The rest of the signals on here are either driving the USB to ULPI, which is 13 signals, I think. Um, and then the remaining three signals left on this block, 1.8 block, uh, will actually be driving uh, these RGB LEDs. Basically, that's the way it's going to work. Because I have basically, I've got 16 pins left that aren't driving the DDR2 memory on this block. 13 of which will be needed for the USB uh, ULPI interface. Three of which I use for the different colors. That's why it's a 1.8 block. But as these are syncing, that shouldn't be an issue. It is an issue. I will need to add um, some small transistors like this to do the job. But I'm hoping I can get away with it. I mean, what I will do um, is have to play around and try it as well first. I can, I can actually physically try that to see what it's like. Now the LEDs I'm using here are these tiny one mil RGB LEDs. Um, they are teeny teeny tiny. You can see them. Let me just take you back to the schematic and you'll see what I'm talking about. So if we zoom in on this, we have actually we're using five of these. Four for the dis for those elements that I'm just wiring up now on the schematic. These four. We also have another one on the other side of the USB, which is the status LED uh, for the system so that has three uh, RGB LEDs in it which are controlled by the done signal from the FPGA which is also read by the STM32 uh, the program signal from the STM32 to the ECP5 to say whether it's programming or not and uh, the status signal from the STM32 just in the same way we had a status signal on the black ice MX so it's very similar in terms of color so the color of this led will show the status you know and if that's uh you know if there's an issue with programming and done isn't lit or done is lit and then unlit uh, the color will be different um, i'm still thinking about which combination i'm going to use for that but i'll probably use status as the green led programming as the blue and then the uh um the uh red one will be from done uh hopefully i'm not dropping frames i did see my frame rate diving slightly there let me know if i'm dropping frames but anyway you can see the size of these just to give you an idea um what would give you an idea well that's a usb c connector so you can see how small it is in comparison to those Hope I'm not giving myself an enormous problem when I come to actually place these. Um, if I show you, you know, this, this is an, is that an 0603? That's an 0402 cap here. And it's not quite as long as that, but it is obviously square. So it is a bit teeny tiny, um, but I'm trying to make everything fit in.
And we need to put that on that so there's just just to drive it. Still gonna move these around a bit. Um yeah, I did disappear, did I? I did see the frame rate go down, I don't know why. Seems to have come back alright. Anyhow, you see, uh, just to remind you, I'm just showing how small these are. I mean, this is a an 0402 cap next to that LED, so you can get a, get an idea of how small they are. Given that you got effectively got three LEDs in there because it's RGB, shows you how teeny tiny they are. Hope there's not going to be too too much of a placement issue. Hopefully, it should be fine. Um, so that's how I want to do the LEDs. Okay, let's go back to the schematic again. Far away any questions, by the way, whilst I'm working on this stuff. Um, You know about amalgam etc uh, in terms of other things that are supported there will be a dfu boot supported over the debug usb um, using the button press in the same way that we uh, had on you know um, black ice mx it's HPD, I'm not sure I need that. I need to think about that. A bit confusing there. Let me shift this over just slightly. Let's have a little bit more breathing room. Okay, what else do we need to do? We need so the oh yeah, show you the other RGB LED. Uh, and maybe if that would go here actually. Move that out for a sec. And bring in so this is the status LED. So that's connected to 3 volt on the anode side. And then the red, green and blue are be something like, I mean, I may juggle this around yet. So we'll have done on the red one. So I'm sticking to the same color signature status on the green. And then blue will be prog. So the status LED will show us um, what we're we going to do with that. Move that out of the way temporarily. Um, so that's the fifth LED, if you like. Get that on. What else do we need to move on to here? Don't avoid doing the USB yet because I have to tackle the. Um, I'm going to need the pull ups, I think, to be. STM32 I squared C. And I need to rearrange these pins because they've changed as well. Do some of that in a minute. The debug. Oh, these are um, these diodes are power diodes, USB connectors. We can start putting those on. Basically, for the V bus, uh, with the diode, all of these. So that any one of them can power the um, V 
the bus supply. You know, we're going to need to mess about with the bus. Automatic from there. Um, need the power LED. There's a single LED that shows its power is on. That's always useful. We go in here, I think. I don't know if that's actually going to be a white or not. But I quite like white ones. I might make it through, I don't know. Could do a pink change. Although they can be difficult to get hold of at the moment. Hmm. Being a little annoying. Place not wise. Just don't want to conform, do you? So this is going to need rearranging a tad. Um, one thing that I need to think about is what the hell we're going to call this board. Because I'm not going to ship with Amalgam on it. That's just a project name. Uh, I've got to fit all this other stuff in. That's going to be fun. I want to make this slightly less cluttered. It got really cluttered before. I need to leave enough room in here to fit the USB bits and bobs. So what I probably want to do is see if I can move this up a tad. Then I can get this sorted. Drag my free out free in me. Right, um, maybe go in there.
Can you fire away any questions, folks? So, I wonder if I can then fit this in here. I know I have to rearrange it before, actually. Let's just see if we can fit everything in. Here. Yeah. I know it's all looking a little small. I will zoom in and a bit. Hate it when I drag the other stuff. I'm wondering actually if I can make myself a little bit more room here. And then move these down slightly. Does that going to enable me to fit this other one in? Yes, that just about fits. We need to fuss about a little bit. Generally speaking, that fits. This might not go in here. I'm still thinking about this. The SD card needs to go on somewhere. I may want to change the type of SD card that this is. Ooh, it didn't quite fit there, did it? Damn it. Didn't really fit anywhere. Let's put it there. Oh, what joy squeezing everything in. Don't you just love it? Yes, right. Um, how am I going to squeeze that in? That's interesting. Shut this over a bit. Start neatening things up. Where's the eighty pin connector? Well, you can't see there's a connector on here, unfortunately. Um, the pins are all loose, but basically, uh, it's X two. Yeah. So it's this entire bank here. Uh, which is bank one, I think. Top PT. And also, uh, and that's what 32 pins, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, this bank, bank zero, um, which is also top, the top quadrant, and there is what, uh, hold on, there is 24, I think, there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thir
coming out quite nicely. It's quite nicely positioned. I want to try and get the best, um, you know, distance I can. So it's relatively short distance, so I get best signal integrity I can. So this is the top of the chip. That's where most of them come from, on the view on the side here. So if you look at the most part of the top quadrant pins, these are all top quadrant, top quadrant. Uh, the exception are these eight, which come from the left hand quadrant. And that left hand quadrant also shares with the FMC bus. If you think about it, logically, they're in a good position to connect to the STM32. Trying to work out where all these different things are is a nightmare. Uh, the worst part are actually the pins on the STM32 because people seem to have chosen those with a dartboard. I mean, they really are all over the place. Um, I'm hoping that we can get all this done on a six layer board and that we don't have to go to eight layer because that puts the cost up significantly. Um, my calculations tell me we should be able to squeeze it into six. But best laid plans is when you get to that routing those final components, you find out whether you've virtually done the right thing or not. Any other questions, guys? I'm just going to take a tea break. Sorry, I should have. Um, let me do that again. I forgot to put the uh, layout at the top so we couldn't actually see what I was saying. So, on here, um, most of the pins for the IO connector here are on this top quadrant. There are a few on the left. And I can just briefly show you. I can turn that on briefly. And you'll see what I mean. Um, you see all these lines coming down to the IO? There's a few on the left here, basically. Yeah, I do need a name for the core part, and we also need to think about what this is going to plug into. But that could be a different conversation. But do please start thinking about that. I appreciate your feedback. Um, going back to a schematic. The memory, by the way, is this one up the top. The pin gobbler. And then uh, in terms of the other banks, uh, the, this is kind of the camera or the video bank, if you like. So on this bank here, um, on the left bank, which is the lower left actually quadrant, um, we've got both the uh, cam inputs and the um, HDMI outputs, which is cool. And there's a few leftover parts which you use for uh, the global clock in, which goes into that bank. That's where it's most critical. And then we've got a TX and RX. So we've got a UART set of UART pins from the STM32 that checks in. So it's always good to have the UART. Um, and that UART can then be represented on the debug USB port um, rather than the high speed USB port. You wouldn't want to waste a high speed USB port just doing serial. Um, uh, we've also got an interrupt as well coming from this port to the STM32. There are times where you need to raise an interrupt. So the way that that will work here is if an interrupt is raised here, because we have the FMC bus, the FMC bus can go and actually look at an interrupt register 
in the ECP5 synthesis uh, to see what caused the interrupt. So we can do that now, you know, um, very quickly over the FMC bus. Um, then the um, and those two at the top, as I mentioned before, are really for controlling the memory, the uh, ULP high-speed USB, and three for the LEDs. And then this kind of miscellaneous one at the bottom here is the programming spy inputs from the STM32. Um, so you've got um, SI, SS, SO, and um, right. it's just SO now. Okay. Got some naming issues here. I need to sort out. So that's how we program it. So what we do is we've got a program line here. So that can puts it into programming mode. We've got the clock line, then we've got serial in, serial out, and we've got to select the SPI. So we use SPI. Um, we should be able to program it pretty fast. The STM32 can actually do SPI, you know, way up to like 133 megahertz. Uh, although we won't be running at that speed. I think the in slave mode, programming mode on ESP5, I think the max is probably about 33 megahertz that it can cope with. So we'll probably drive it down to those sorts of speeds, you know, 30 megahertz or something. Um, given that the size, including memory, could be something like 5 or 10 megabits, um, that probably take about a third of a second at 30 megahertz. Roughly. We'll see. Um, the configure pins here tell us how we're going to program it. And I think these, these two will go down low. That will go high, I think. Let's double check that in the programming guide. Um, the other pins here. So the other thing, the other thing we're going to do here is the DP, DP and D plus. These aren't DP and D plus anymore. So some of these will be the um, CL0, CL1, etc. So it'll probably be something like yeah. I'll probably do that. Just do. Same one there, and then this will probably be um, card select. Yes, yes, let's just leave that for a moment because this shares the SPI with the SD card, and then these will then be, um, you know, for driving the LED. So CL0, oh, what am I doing? CL1. Zero. Um, see now one see now two see now three. LEDs. This is always a bit of a miscellaneous port, this one, because it has the programming pins on it and the SPI input for the programming, plus a few others which can be used for different things. So 
here we're using it for programming the SPI. It's also used to do SPI in and out. So for example, um, that SPI can either talk to the STM32 or uh, it could talk to the SD card directly if it wanted to. Um, then the others and uh, also driving the anode of the LEDs. It's a three volt free powered port. So CL0, 1, 2 and 3 as we drew out before just to remind you didn't see that uh, these anode signals to the RGB LEDs the RGB display and then the final ones are the rest of the interface ports um, for the FMC interface so we basically have a, a weight signal so we can do asynchronous bursts and things we have a write enable uh, an output enable and we have a um, chip select and we have um, oh what's this signal we need the scissors address valid signal why is it P -A -N -L? Not L. maybe that should be VL I'll have to double check that. Thinking about it, that's just got me wondering. If we could squeeze, if we could squeeze another one in, we could have a second. Um, we've got Dane one there. We could have Dane two as well. It would work for the uh, or for the high end version, maybe. I don't know. I don't think we've got any pins left. I have literally used every single pin that's available on this 256 ball FPGA because I want to squeeze the maximum value out of this absolute maximum value leave no stone unturned as they say <sighs> right, so that's those. It's starting to look a little bit crowded in here. So a few more pieces to come in. Got the SD card here. Hmm. Hmm. How many do I need for this? I need two for the USB DMDP. Plus I need two for the... I don't need two of these. I only need one of these, I think. Oh, that'd be good. That'd be really good. I was just looking at buying some of these. I only need half as many if I can get rid of that. In terms of the signals here, so what I'm going to have is... So this will obviously be, so these little things are protectors uh, for the USB signals. When I'm using the ULPI uh, interfaces, these have this stuff built in, so we don't need to add it. Um, but when we're connecting things like the microcontroller to the um, USB, it's a good idea to put one of these uh, static voltage protectors on them. And these are low capacitance as well, so don't slow things down. But this is a special one. This is slightly different to the normal one. You normally have a pass-through arrangement where you go, you know, DP and DM or D plus D minus on one side, and then you connect those to these on that side. But this is different. This actually has four protection points, so it doesn't pass through. So it's a very uh, compact way of doing um, what I'm going to show you. So the way that this gets wired up, which is interesting, is you have, let's say you have D minus here, sorry, D plus, D plus 2. And you have D minus 
here. So then we call that uh, DP. So what I'm doing here, because this is USB C and that's D minus. And then back and back and back. Just label this. So these will be connected to this one here. SDP, STM. Oh, these have all got mixed up. Right, okay, so let's just. So this is the debug USB output, or this is capable of carrying both debug and USB signals for CDC serial port output from the STM32. Now the other pins here, and this is where it's super smart. I've had a real, real bugbear with. Um, oh. With debugging. Okay. So these side channel pins, SBU1 and SBU2, I'm going to use to actually carry the. Um, I want to put some labels on here so we know what we're talking about. I'm going to use these to carry, um, what do I call them on here? I'm going to use, my, use these for my debug pins. And I'll explain that in a minute. You may be thinking, what, what on earth is he doing? Those aren't USB pins, but you can chuck anything down the side channel on the USB. You're allowed to. Okay. And then the other thing we have to do is we have to probably do, I think we have to do, I think we have to pull one of these up and one of them down. I can't bloody remember which way, which way is which. I think, hold on, how many of these have we got? 5Ks. 5Ks. Even the one of those. RN1, RN1, RN1. I'm going to need another one of these, maybe. It's just Make another one. I don't really want to be using more than I need to here, but let's just temporarily. So what we'll have is um, hmm. this signal here. CC one will just literally be tied down to ground. Because this tell I think this is used for orientation on USB C so it knows which way the cable is round. Okay, oh, that's a bit crowded there. We're gonna have to sort this out. Now the other one, however, this is a clever bit we're going to use. Probably going to pull it up. Is it pull it down? I can't remember. Um, but this is going to be uh, SW. Oh. Hmm. 
which is the third debug pin, which is really useful on the STM32s. I don't know if I've marked it on here. That is, yeah, that's a bit mixed up here. These are all these pins have changed around. I need to change it. It's one of these pins here. It's not yet named, so we'll have to go and sort that out. Those are the old pinouts. So basically what we have there is on this USB connector, this USB-C connector, we have USB probably running CDC class, serial class, that can be used to output, you know, a serial port from over maybe the um, uh, FPGA serial port as a terminal. Um, it can also be used to output messages if we want. We could even use it to program the FPGA, you know, black eye style if we wanted to. So we could possibly put that in for backward compatibility. Um, in addition, on this USB-C connector, we've got our debug lines. Um, so what we can do is then hook that into a small adapter, USB adapter, that breaks out the USB signals which we can connect to our J-Link or our uh, SW-Link. Um, I'm even thinking of building my own, maybe, SWD debugger stuff. I don't know if I'm going to have time to do all of that, but for the moment it will just be a breakout, and that's nice because I hate having these horrible debug connectors in the middle of the board and all the wires going in and out. So it'll all be nice and compact and neat and lovely. And I'm really looking forward to that. Do you like my cleverness? I knew you'd be impressed. And no, I can't fit JTAG down there from the ECB5. We don't have a thought about it. Um, you know, there are some spare pins. You know, on the... Uh, on the USB connector. I could use the side bus channels for... Uh, Um, TDO and TDI and then CC1 would be clock but I'd have to bend the rules on CC2 in order to use it as a TMS signal and I don't have a reset which is maybe you could probably do about the reset but you know I'm less bothered about that at the moment I've already included a uh, debug connector, uh, which will go on the board, um, which I might not actually place, but you could add that in. I have the footprint for it there, possibly. I don't know how important it is to have the uh, JTAG on the ESP5, but I will make it accessible for those that want to use it. Cramming it down the USB is probably not such a good idea because we'd have to do something slightly non-standard. Uh, which I'm not keen to do. Also, on these high-speed USB channels, I don't want to mess with them. I just want the cables to be straight through, really. You know, straight into the host. Because um, signal integrity is really important, that high speed. You know, it's half a gigabit per second. You don't want to be messing with having things in between, generally speaking. But that's all kind of cool. So it's all coming on now. Not much more to do on this. What I will have to do, um, get rid of that, done those. Uh, still got a whole bunch of decouplers to add in. 
Um, I think I can lose that finally. Should be nice. Um, Everything's just about crammed in. You bits and bobs. Um, the other things that are on the 80 pin connector I should mention. So obviously we've got the 64 digital IOs from the ESP5, which can either be single or differential signals. It's either 32 or 64, depending which way you're aiming. Um, there's eight analog ADC inputs. Uh, there's also an I. There should be a UART external UART pins, which may be useful for connecting to things like Bluetooth, for example. So I want to add a Bluetooth option. Um, there will also be um, there's a signal on there that's I2C. It can also do CAN. I'm not that bothered about the can stuff, frankly. Um, what else will be on there? Are there any other signals on there? Some power signals. So that's 64 digital signals from the ESP5 plus 8, that's 72. I squared C, 74. UART 76 and then we've got four pins which can be used for power so we want B bus um, 3 volt free ground and maybe hmm, I don't know if we want to expose the 2 volt 5 or the um, 1 volt 8 Two volt pops not very useful. I don't even know if one volt eight is actually any use. But maybe we could have a VBAT as a fourth signal, possibly. Might be useful. I don't know how important battery powering this would be. Um, this isn't the most frugal of powers, you know, the ECP5s are not necessarily low power devices. I mean, they are relative to, you know, some of the big FPGAs, but, you know, in, in the lattice family, they're quite a way up the chart compared to things like the uh, ICE 40 range, for example, or the new um, Certius. Service, I get confused what they're calling them. How are we doing for time? 22.05. Right, any questions? Because I might just call it a day. Um, I've got to go and redo the. Um, these USBs are pinned out wrong. Somebody did a copy and paste job on these. Uh, luckily, I noticed. Um, so I need to fix that. Um, but that's kind of boring. You probably won't want to see that. I can do that. That's just a case of fixing the library, rearranging the pins. Um, so I can get that done. I've also got to finish off the routing, obviously, which I can do over the next week or so. Uh, the bits left on the side, we don't need the SWD stuff, that's there to remind me, I don't need those in. The boot one, we won't need. The decoupling stuff, yeah, we're going to need that, and a bit more. The debug connection, we've already got. Uh, that should go down here, I think already might need to loosen that up a bit um the hp detect we're not using currently because i don't have a pin for it unless i take that to stm32 
Uh, and the high end bulb has got a CEC connector as well, by the way, which is nice. This is the decal thing we showed in. I need to squeeze in this SD card. I've also got a problem with placing this SD card. I need to find the right kind of SD card socket to fit it into my board here, into the amalgam that we're designing, because um, that's not. Um, I can get rid of this now. Goodbye. Goodbye. We don't need you anymore. Um, don't need these anymore. I need to remember those then. I need to remember which way around those are. All oh, that will go. This probably isn't going to go on there. That can go on the debug expansion breakout. The reason for having this is to. Oh, 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 oh. How am I going to do that? Hmm, I need to be careful about that. That should really go on the board. But the problem is, I have to use one of the ADCs. Hmm. I'd also need a com common V bus. So this is basically for um, power monitoring. That's what this is for. I'll have a think about that. Right, any questions before I slope off for the evening? Come on, Laurie, you've normally got something that I've missed. What do you think? Is it all okay? Am I missing something really significant? Hey, help not. Remind me how many of the USB connectors. All right, well, let's go back to the CAD view. Hold on. So if you look at the top here, let me do it from left to right. So this is a high speed, half a gigabit per sec USB or 80 megabyte per sec via a ULPI interface to the ECP5. That's connected directly into the ECP5. You can program that obviously as a host or device depending on your gateway. Um, this USB is a debug USB. It's a, it's a full speed, not high speed. So that's like 12 megabytes per second. And that's got the CDC class, serial class on it. It's also got the SWD uh, signals for debugging the STM32. Then this one on the right hand side is again a high speed, you know, half a gigabit per second, 480 megabyte per second, uh, ULPI based. Uh, high-speed USB which is connected to the STM32. So you've got three C connectors each with individual USB, two of which are high-speed, half gig per second, one of which is low-speed, 12 megabytes per second, which is used for debugging and uh, serial type stuff, CDC serial, serial over USB. That answer the question. And if you want any more than that, you've got 64 IOs on the connector. Don't forget this. When we sell this board, you know, when it's sold as a, as a, as a, um, you know, a, a community dev board, this is going to sit on something else, and that something else could be all sorts of different things that could have, you know, all sorts of other things. So you might want to add some like USB A. Example. Let's be a connectors, the game ports or whatever.
But uh, any other questions, guys? Because otherwise, I'm going to call it quits. And then I probably won't stream again until next week, next Wednesday. Unless something significant, you know, is achieved in the meantime that I need, desperately need to cover on the stream. But yeah, please also think about what am I going to call this core board? Because it is a core board, just like we have ice core right now. Obviously, I can't call it ice core because there's no ice component in it. An ECP core. It's not much of a ring to it, is it? Um, so we need a name for it. Um, so if you can think of any names, guys and girls, let me know on the next stream. Um, otherwise, I will leave you with it. Thank you for joining me once again this evening. Hope it was useful. I'm certainly chomping at the bit to get the first one of these made. What I'll probably do is I'll probably make a couple to start with. Um, so I'll make one myself. And if that works reasonably, then I'll get another one out there as well. So we've got at least two running. Um, and then we'll, at that point, decide to make the next, you know, the first batch. What I'll probably do when I make the first one, I'll probably make it with a 12F rather than an 85. I think. Because they're cheaper to fuck up. Excuse my language. Because the first bring up is all about making sure that everything is connected to everything else. Right? And that the right signals are in place, etc. So the first one is often the sacrificial one. We very, I very rarely end up using any of my first makes in practice. They normally get um, not binned because I keep them. Although I don't know where all my old stuff is. I mean, I've got probably one of most of the ones that I've made, apart from maybe a Black Eyes Two. It's a shame. I like black ice too. Anyhow, that's me, guys. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, I'll speak to you again down on Discord. Um, when we actually get a name for this thing, I'll set up a channel specifically for that. Um, also, uh, yeah, Discord channel or the forum. Um, and if I get any other significant development news on this, I'll, I'll keep keep those channels updated. Brilliant. All right. Thanks, guys and girls. And I will see you next week if I don't see you before on the forums or Discord channel. Okay.